So welcome back to um, the final paper of the first session. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Ilyang Li from uh, Beijing University of International Business and Economics, who will present a co-authored paper uh, on global supply chain disruptions on uh, and their effect on macroeconomic outcomes, so nicely complementing the two papers we saw earlier this morning. And then we will have the discussion by Hilde Bjornland from uh, the Norwegian Business School. So very happy to have you here, and we'll start with you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me here again. Um, so uh, this is actually the second time that we have presented this paper at the ECB. So uh, we presented the same thing last year at the Inflation Drivers and Dynamics Conference. Uh, but I promise you, uh, for this time, we bring something new uh, to the floor, which we are really uh, excited to share with you. So uh, this is a co-authored paper, as I said, with uh, Xu Wen, Isuz, and Francesco. And, um, the motivation of this paper is actually very straightforward because we have been discussing uh, the health of global supply chain disruptions and their causal effects for a very long time. But uh, this paper actually focuses on the COVID-19 pandemic, but now I think it carries a more wider implication because, uh, you know, for example, the Red Sea crisis that we are currently experiencing and also this rising geopolitical fragmentation uh, which I believe also fall into this category of global supply chain disruptions. So for this study, we think, you know, uh, even though the, most of the focus is on the COVID, but it still bears more stuff to be understood for the wider, uh, you know, thought of global supply chain disruptions. And then now, uh, even though this is a question that we put forward for the paper, but now it's actually becoming our agenda, which is what are, cause, what are the causal effects and policy implications of global supply chain disruptions? And then for this very paper, uh, we wanted to break that into three very specific questions. The first one will be, um, how, how could we actually measure uh, you know, the supply chain disruption shock? And then uh, you know, in this very paper, we have developed a uh, index of global supply chain disruptions based on the satellite data of container ships using machine learning uh, and also very granular data. So in this case, we wanted to compare our index with the, some of the popular indices online, for example, shipping costs, and also this global supply chain pressure index compiled by the New York Fed. And uh, we will show you that, you know, even though we are not the perfect measure, but we believe on some, you know, fronts, uh, our you know, index could offer uh, better insights into you know, how this global supply chain disruptions have uh, escalated, essentially. And then this is the first specific question. The second one will be something that we want to do with the help of theoretical model. In this sense, we wanted to distinguish what we call a supply chain disruption shock from what we normally see in macro papers, for example, like a demand shock, and also what we call a productive capacity shock. In this sense, you can understand this productive capacity shock as a labor supply shock. So here we wanted to say, okay, now we have these three types of shock, uh, shocks, and then we wanted to, you know, to see how each of them compares to the others and how, you know, how different they are in terms of the macroeconomic impacts on some macro variables. So that's the second question we wanted to answer. And then, you know, the last one, which I believe it is also the most important one, is what will be the policy implications coming from, you know, this analysis of global supply chain disruptions. In particular, we wanted to break that into two parts. The first one will be, you know, uh, in, in, in facing a supply chain disruption shock, should we actually do a monetary tightening in order to tackle its, you know, stagflationary uh, effects, or should we just, you know, uh, using a whole steady approach. So this is the first question we wanted to talk about. The second one will be, okay, now if we wanted to do the first one, which is, you know, monetary tightening, how aggressive should we be, you know, when we're trying to raise the policy rates? So that is crucial because, you know, you know we, we all know that there, will, there is a very classic trade-off when using a tightening of monetary policy. That is, you're gonna have to sacrifice activities and output in, you know, to, to get inflation controlled. But then, you know, just in, the fa in facing this policy trade-off, 
Should we um, do not need to care about it too much during global supply chain disruptions, or should we still care about it? I'm going to give you an answer to that uh, just right away. Okay, uh, speaking of our contributions in this very paper, so it's quite long actually, but uh, we try to summarize that into four parts. The first one is that we develop a very new spatial clustering algorithm essentially to transform the satellite data of container ships into a high frequency index, index of port congestion that is applicable to all the major ports around the world. So this is a very uh, novel thing because previously uh, we really rely on macro theories, more macro indices to gauge the health of global supply, you know, global supply chain. But now I'm offering you that with this satellite data and some you know, very simple machine learning tactics, you can actually go into this question and have a uh, comprehensive coverage of how the global supply chain disruptions have spanned out around the globe. So this is the first thing. And what we get out of this is an index of global supply chain disruptions, which we could directly use in a uh, time series analysis, for example, using SVRs or local projections. And then it comes to the second part of our paper, which is we wanted to use a framework, uh, for example, the SVRs with sign and zero restrictions. But in order to use the sign restrictions, we need to come up with some theoretical foundation for them. because. When we wanted to separate, for example, the causal effects of a demand shock from that of a supply chain disruption shock, we impose a positive sign on unemployment. But how you know, do we have a theoretical foundation for this positive sign? So that's why we develop a very novel and a simple theory that tries to rationalize how we impose these sign restrictions on the macro aggregates uh, in response to each of the three shocks that I just mentioned. And it is very simple because all we need from it are just comparative settings so we can impose the sign restrictions. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of this um, in this presentation, but I'm not going to the technical details. So now I have an index from the first part of the paper. I have now from the second part some of the sign restrictions, sign and zero restrictions, the identification restrictions. Now it's ready to put them together into the very standard SVR analysis. So in here, we do a causality analysis and trying to you know, quantify the causal effects of global supply chain disruptions. In particular, even though the focus of this conference is on Europe, uh, in the paper, we focus on the states and we show that during each different historical episodes, the main drivers behind the elevated inflation in the United States were quite different. And just in a nutshell, in 2021, it was the global supply chain disruptions that really drove inflation in the, sti in, in the states uh, higher up. So that's the third bit. And then it comes to the last bit, uh, which is the policy implications. So what we did is that, okay, we still use our index and also still use our very simple model. We try to say, okay, during the global supply chain disruptions, has the trade-off between stabilizing inflation and sacrificing economic activities changed following this? So uh, in terms of the result, we show that, okay, during the global supply chain disruptions, the supply curve has actually steepened a lot, which is consistent with the, previous, the results from the previous two papers. And from that, we have a very simple you know, policy implication, which is you can be as aggressive as possible. So this is the whole paper. And then due for the time's sake, I may not be able to go through some of the related literature, and it, but you can see that the previous two papers are in this. So now I would really like to get into this uh, very interesting, in my opinion, part of this paper, which is how we measure global supply chain disruptions. So um, as I said before, we go into this, uh, we really focus on this containerized trade, which is, you know, the primary mode of transporting goods around the globe. In fact, if you go back to the statistics, you can see that you know, this containerized maritime trade actually accounts for 46% of global trading value. And more importantly, some of the other you know, cargo that were transported over, you know, uh, you know, over the seas will be uh, oil, which may not really be something that we wanted to focus on in this paper, but also some of the others could be specialized vessels, row and row off. But here, containerized trade is our focus. And then another reason why we you know, consider this is you know, when you compare the containerized industry with some of the other maritime industries, such as dry bulk or oil, 
there is a very unique feature of this industry that gives us an advantage. That is, this containerized industry is very rigid in the sense that the routes, speeds of these container ships, they are rarely changed, no matter what happened to demand or other circumstances. But, you know, uh, as I will show you a little bit later on, you know, what happened right now in the Red Sea, the Red Sea crisis, actually makes this statement a little bit, uh, you know, different from what we're actually arguing in this paper, but still it's focusing on the global supply chain disruption. And then as I put here in the, in the, in the presentation slides, just because containerized trade is so important, you know, the, the roles of seaports in this containerized trade would actually affect a lot of things because when you imagine a lot of container ships due to logistic reasons cannot really load or unload cargo at some ports in Europe, that will create very large problems. Okay, now it speaks to, uh, you know, what we, what we really mean by port congestion. We go into the maritime literature by estimating you know, whether a container ship will first moor in an anchorage before docking at a berth. So these are two jargons, but let me you know, break them out for you. So the first one is an anchorage, which is a random area to lower the anchors, and then a berth is a designated sport to load and unload the cargo. So for, for fun, I just inserted two pictures for you to check. So on the left-hand side panel here, it's essentially a typical burst that we will normally see in the pictures, in the news, in the media. But then on the right-hand side, that is the anchorage, which is essentially some area outside the port where you know, a ship can lower the anchor. So in the maritime literature, it actually is, you know, the, the definition of how to, sorry, how to quantify port congestion is pretty much fixed. So whether we, if we see uh, a ship directly go into the berth and start loading and unloading cargo, that essentially means there is no port congestion. But it's really difficult to see these sort of situations in, in, in real life because there is always gonna be some port congestion. So you can always see, for example, from the right-hand side, a lot of container ships, they lower the anchors in these random areas, in these anchorages. So now, what we wanted to do, okay, given this definition, could we come up with an index to measure port congestion. The answer is yes, we could do, because now we have access to the automatic identification system data, which is essentially a real-time satellite tracking system installed on these vessels. The beauty of this is that it will give you very high signals, very high information, you know, very high frequency data on, for example, the identity of this ship, the geographical locations, the speed, and even the drought of this vessel, which is essentially you know, how deep the ship is submerged. So given this um, you know, automatic identification system data, we, you know, we, we you know, uh, you know, along with it, we use machine learning to handle such a big, massive data because uh, as you can see on the slides, this AIS system actually updates information as frequently as two seconds. So here, it is a typical automatic identification system device that you can buy online. Uh, so for ours, you know, due to the International Maritime Organization, every ship on the Earth, you know, that is greater than 300 gross tonnage, will be required to install one of these devices. But for some other ships, which is even smaller, they, it's better to install this as well for security reasons, which essentially you know, makes the coverage of our sample uh, you know, almost universal. And then, uh, just for the same of this conference, I, I changed the picture of my original presentation, but now I'm showing you the first 50,000 AIS observations uh, outside the port of Rotterdam, you know, since the 1st of January 2020. So each of these blue dots represents a spatial temporal data point of a container ship outside the port of Rotterdam. So this is essentially the data we will be looking at. And how do we process that? It's essentially a supervised machine learning spatial clustering algorithm. I'm not going into the details, but essentially it takes into account the different behaviors of those container ships in berths and anchorages, and then use this information to come up with the geographical boundaries of these uh, different locations within the port. And then we, for example, look at some of the very granular information which I presented in this slide. On the left-hand side, you can see that 
uh, we plot the, we, we take advantage of the headings of those container ships at a burst. For example, when a ship is docking at a burst to load and unload cargo, you can expect that the headings of these container ships will be either aligned or 180 degrees, you know, uh, it's essentially, essentially the opposite. But then if you look at those headings of container ships at an anchorage, a random area outside the port, it's difficult for them to make this uh, closely aligned situation, uh, you know, closely aligned uh, circumstance because the winds and the tides will make the container ships not be able to stay in a particular location for a very long time. So that's why they appear in the ring ship. So we take into account a lot of granular information like this and then come up with our identification results, which I show here in this figure. So remember, I just show you the raw data, but here we actually, uh, you know, after using the machine learning algorithm to process the data, we classify those, uh, some of the points as anchorages and some of the other points as bursts. So here in the figure, the purple, blue, and red points represent those container ships staying in anchorage. Well, then for those other colors, uh, the markers of other colors, they represent the bursts, uh, the bursts in the ports of Rotterdam. And in particular, these are the differences between these two locations. So, okay, we now have a machine learning algorithm which basically gave us the geographical boundaries of bursts and anchorages for all the universe of ports, major ports around the world. So now it's time to use the information we have in the AIS data and these geographical boundaries to, to tell whether a ship has actually lowered the anchors in an anchorage before docking at a burst, which is essentially our definition of port congestion. So we do this in several steps. So first of all, as I said, we identify the geographical boundaries. And then we count the numbers of ships at each port that first moor in an anchorage before docking at a burst at a monthly frequency. We could do even finer temporal resolution at weekly frequency, uh, you know, depending on the needs, uh, you know, uh, it is also possible. Um, but here we focus on the monthly frequency. And then we calculate the congestion rate for each port by dividing the number of delete ships by the total number of ship visits. So this is our normalization stage. And then eventually we do a weighted average of all these congestion rates for the major ports around the world and derive this average congestion rate, which will be our index of global supply chain disruptions. So some fun facts to share with you. First of all, uh, this is a heat map that we created for uh, not all the container ports we consider, but the first, the top 10 ports around the world, plus some of the major container ports that you see in Europe. For example, you can see that uh, for periods in, uh, in Greece, uh, before the pandemic, you know, there wasn't a very clear uh, increasing pattern for port congestion. But during the pandemic, you can see that this you know, port congestion has escalated. And then towards the end of the sample, it sort of you know, faded away. Even though there were uh, quite a lot of differences between the congestion rates across these ports, in general, you can see that there's an increase in port congestion during the pandemic phase. And that's essentially how we measure global supply chain disruption. As I said, the last step will be aggregation. Now I just show you all the congestion rates for the ports. It's time to group them together. And how does it look like? It looks like what we have in the right-hand side. So before the pandemic, from 20, January 2017 to uh, before the onset of the pandemic, it actually has a declining trend. So we argue in the paper that it is due to, you know, uh, you know, the building or improving infrastructure around the world. But just following the onset of the pandemic, you can see this average congestion rate increased a lot to a historical, uh, to a historical peak of 37%, which essentially means for all the container ships around the world which load and unload cargo at all these major ports, 37% of them would experience some delays uh, at the, you know, uh, during the pandemic. So this is a shocking evidence on how severe the global supply chain disruption uh, was during the pandemic. And then, as I said, you know, we are not really offering a perfect measure, but we do believe this measure has some advantages over the other indices. For example, uh, we are trying to argue that this ACR index is largely independent of uh, changes in demand. 
And the very reason for this is because of, as I mentioned, the nature of the, uh, this very industry, because it's quite rigid. But also we have some other uh, advantages. For example, it is because it's coming from the satellite data, so in virtually you don't have any measurement errors. Uh, now it's time to compare how this index uh, looks different from, differently from the other indices. For example, here, which I show you, you know, how this index compares to the Hopper Peterson Time Charter Race Index, which is essentially a popular measure of shipping costs. You can see that during the pandemic, the rises in these two indices sort of uh, corresponded to each other. But the major difference comes from what happened at the onset of the pandemic. We're arguing that for the shipping cost, because it is an equilibrium object, it is of course subject to changes in demand. And it's just because these changes in demand will map into, for example, higher shipping prices. If you use shipping prices in your SVRs, you will lead to some you know, uh, endogeneity issues. So in this case, we are saying, okay, if you use our ACR, you will get something quite different. And then we're comparing our ACR index to the GSCPI compiled by the uh, New York Fed. And you can see that the, the difference comes from, uh, you know, also similar to what I've just shown you, what happened during the onset of the pandemic. You can see that GSCPI uh, rose up a lot during the pandemic and then quickly back down but our index showing that at least at the onset of the pandemic, global supply chain disruptions hasn't really escalated. Okay, this is essentially what we have done in this paper, but uh, uh, following the same of the conference, I wanted to show you that uh, this is, as uh, speaking to some of the previous presentations, the COVID pandemic was not the only global supply chain disruption. In particular, I wanted to highlight several things that we have been studying. For example, here, the first one will be the attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea. And for that one, I wanted to show you what we have been discovering. So here, I'm showing you, you know, this vessel rerouting pass following the uh, Red Sea crisis. You can see that the major consequence of this is that those container ships that used, that used to take the Suez Canal route from Asia to Europe will now start to take the Cape route around the Cape of Good Hope to reach Europe. So that will lead to a massive reduction in maritime supply, considering that those ships have to cover longer miles and also at higher speed. So we managed to quantify this and showing you this figure, the reduction in maritime supply, we call that uh, reduction in time miles, in, related, in relation to this very recent you know, Red Sea crisis. Here, we are looking at the, uh, we're increasing the temporal resolution to a monthly frequency to a weekly frequency. So even though this still needs some refinement, but here, if you focusing on the end of the sample, which is essentially uh, December 2023 or January 2024, uh, 20, uh, 2024, you can see that there's a very sharp increase in the vessel rerouting. And that led to actually the, 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 the single most largest reduction in maritime supply in history, at least from our sample. So we are saying that, okay, the COVID may have subsided, but here now the Red Sea crisis, and also maybe later on when the geographic, uh, geopolitical fragmentation has escalated to a certain level, this global supply chain disruption may come back, may come back again. And also we are now looking at some of the other aspects, for example, uh, global climate issues. So uh, in, the, in, in 2023, there was actually a very severe drought at the Panama Canal and also the ensuing uh, El Nino effect. So we're also trying to quantify how much uh, of this uh, has an impact on the congestion rate at the Panama Canal. Following the essentially the same method, we actually plot this reduction in maritime supply following uh, for the Panama, Panama Canal. And you can see that in 2023 onwards, there is an increase in the reduction of maritime, maritime supply just because there was a very severe drought at the Panama Canal. And considering how important the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal are to the global supply chain, we really believe this will go on uh, for some extended period of time. Okay, considering I only have a very short limit of time, I would really go through the rest of this paper very quickly. So as I mentioned, now we have an index, the ACR. The next thing is to develop a model in order to uh, use the 
uh, model implications along with the index into the SVRs. So what we really have in mind is that we need to have a model that links this spare productive capacity and also this scarcity in retail supply. Because from the literature, people have been arguing, okay, you know, you know this global supply chain disruption stem from you know, disruptions in the production networks. But we take a different approach because we really think production, transportation, and consumption, they are three distinct stages. And they are connected in some ways, but they shouldn't be, at least for the transportation stage, they shouldn't be uh, overlooked. So here we are saying, okay, anything happens to the transportation sector will bring, spare, will bring about spare productive capacity in the production market, but also uh, you know, uh, scarcity in retail in retail supply in the consumption sector. So this is the first thing that we want to do with a model. And as I mentioned, we also wanted to use the model to come up with identification restrictions. And also that links to uh, the third point here, which we wanted to have a lot of shocks, these three types of shocks in the model. So this is the rationale for the model. And then we have actually three choices. The first one will be a production network model and also uh, a new Keynesian model with transportation cost, and um, also maybe a search and matching uh, model with transportation cost. So for the objective of this paper, we believe a search and matching model will be appropriate, and that is because in the search and matching framework, you have this treating externality coming from this matching function. The beauty of this is that you really don't have to go into so, detail, so much detail about how this matching frictions have, uh, you know, you don't really need to go into the micro foundation of this uh, you know, matching friction. But the, 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 the point is that during the supply chain disruption, it's just because you have matching frictions that makes the allocative rule of prices no longer uh, valid. In the sense that you know, during global supply chain disruptions, the production uh, may not be in a way that you know, the production may be reduced in such a way that it cannot really meet the demand in the retail market. In that sense, no matter how high the demand is and how high the prices will be, there will still be some shares of producers and retailers that cannot be matched to each other. And that is essentially the core of this global supply chain disruption that we think uh, we could do in this model. So the key features is uh, we have uh, matching frictions and endogenous separation of producer and retailer matches on transportation cost. But bringing these two features in the model gave us this, uh, you know, this very simple graph, which is basically showing you that we have a supply curve, but more importantly, we have some wedges between what we consider as a theoretical upper bound and this aggregate supply. And that is essentially, as you can see in the, in the slide, spare capacity. So skipping some of the details, uh, I'm just jumping straight to the comparative statics, which we derived from the model. As I mentioned, we have three types of shocks, aggregate demand, productive capacity, and supply chain. So if you focus on uh, you know, our prediction on consumption, price, and spare capacity, you can see that you know, just simply looking at the signs of uh, the impacts on consumption, price, and spare capacity will be able to distinguish the three types of shocks. So now, it is, this is essentially what we have from the second part of the paper. Now it's ready to go to the causal effects of global supply chain disruption. So I think the most interesting, interesting result comes from the historical decomposition of the U.S. goods inflation, which I show you in this very figure. So as I mentioned, uh, after using the SVR framework, we can see that before the onset of the pandemic, uh, it's actually the improving global supply chain actually bring down inflation. But then following the onset of the pandemic, sorry, uh, just following the onset of the pandemic, you can see that the sharp drop in inflation was primarily coming from a very sharp drop in demand. But then subsequently, you can see that uh, there is a uh, you know, escalation of global supply chain disruption that drove inflation up. But then that, you know, the, the role has changed because uh, just after the start of the 2022, you can see that this productive capacity shock has actually taken a more important role in driving up inflation. And this is consistent with some other evidence because uh, people have found that at the start of 2022, it is the over, you know, overheated labor market in the United States that kept inflation elevated. But then uh, 
you know, as, you know, at least for the US, you can see after that, there is a drop in inflation. And at the same time, uh, you can see demand has been somehow, you know, has somehow muted, but then supply chain has recovered. So this is essentially what we find from the historical decomposition of US goods inflation. Okay, coming back to coming down to the very last part of this paper, which is talking about which is to talk about the effectiveness of monetary policy. So, as I mentioned, we wanted to study whether this stabilization trade-off between inflation and output has changed. So, uh, in the model, we actually have you know all of these uh, instruments available. For example, if we wanted to consider a contractory monetary policy shock, we have money supply in the model. And if we consider supply chain disruption, we actually have this scale parameter of the distribution of transportation cost. So now it's time to uh, use the model to tell us some of the predictions that we can have on whether this stabilization trade-off has changed. So the most important result we get from the paper is that when the increase in product market tightness is sufficiently large during supply chain disruption, it will intensify the fall in inflation while dampening the fall in consumption during, uh, you know, that is associated with the contraction monetary policy shock. To see this clearly, I will just show you this figure, for example, on the left-hand side. You can see that the, uh, when there is a supply chain, this global supply chain disruption, in the model at least, we say that there's gonna be a shift of the supply curve from the solid blue line to the dashed blue line uh, in the graph. And then that will change the slope of the, uh, the supply curve. And why is that? And that is because during the global supply chain disruption, the matching friction would essentially mean no matter how high the prices will be, the number of matches would pretty much be uh, fixed or determined. In that sense, you will really need very high, uh, you know, very large increases in prices to induce an extra number of match uh, between the producer and retailers. In that sense, you may not really have uh, the traditional stabilization bias that we see in the normal, during the normal times. So given that I'm running out of time, I'm just gonna jump straight away to the conclusion. So uh, as I said, we study the causal effects and the policy implications of global supply chain disruptions, and we have a new index, we have a new model, and we put all of them together into the SVR uh, framework. And the two results we have is that supply chain disruptions generate stagflation accompanied by an increase in spare capacity. But more importantly, we find that monitoring tightening could tame inflation you know, uh, without really sacrificing output during times of global supply chain disruptions. And I think that's all we have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ilyang. And then we, we move to Hilda, please. OK, uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's great to be here and uh, at this inaugural conference for CHAMP. Seems to be a really relevant network going forward. Uh, and I think the world is, we are seeing all these kind of crises which we thought were we didn't think we were going to experience them, and they seem to be occurring one after another, and, and we get great research out of that, and papers today, at least, has been, been very topical on that sense. Uh, and thank you also for allowing me to discuss this really nice paper. I really, really enjoyed the paper, so I was happy to accept immediately. Okay, so um, briefly, what are they doing? So they are introducing so they're doing three things, which we already heard. They are introducing a novel index uh, to measure global supply chain uh, pressures so or dis uh, disruptions based on congestion at container, uh, at container, for container ships at major ports across the world. Uh, and they are then using high-frequent maritime satellite data, which were introduced in 2017, and which is a really uh, efficient way to, to look at this market. And then they are integrating this index into a theory model to get uh, implication for our, uh, how to identify these shocks and how do they relate to demand and supply uh, shocks and how will that affect the macroeconomy. Uh, 
and that gives you a nice input into the empirical model, the structural VAR model, for how to identify the different shocks. And then they can analyze effect for, for macro variables like inflation and GDP. And then finally, they analyze the effect uh, or the effectiveness of policy in stabilizing inflation given these types of shocks. We already seen how the index looks like, but here it is again. So this shows the index from 2017 until 2023. And of course, it's striking that the, the rise uh, during the COVID pandemic and, and beyond is 50% increase. But also, as was noted, the, uh, the decline in the trend is also something which, uh, uh, which uh, is an important indication prior to, uh, prior to the COVID. So what did I think of the paper? Uh, really nice, as I already said. Uh, but the contribution is also quite large, uh, but again, in these three different areas. So uh, for me, at least, I think the main contribution is the construction of the index. And, and I didn't know a lot about this market uh, or the shipping market, but I know a lot about the oil, so I will have most of my com comment on that area. But I think the nice thing, in addition to constructing this unique index, is that it's uh, immediate and precise. And I think that's really what policymakers need to have something which they can observe at least, if not immediately in real time, but very, uh, uh, very quickly. And the fact that it's also high frequent gives it huge advantages over other uh, indicators. And I think uh, as well, uh, and I think uh, that this is not something we were just going to see during uh, or being studied for the COVID pandemic. This is something we're going to see being useful going forward with a lot of the um, uh, situation we're going to have in the, in the world economy. Uh, but I also like very much the theoretical contribution uh, and in, in particular how it uh, relates to um, how they can in, in identify the true global supply shocks. Uh, some of the other indexes which are out there, like the New York Fed uh, Global Supply Chain Index, which I've been using together with somebody from Norgas Bank, which I'll come back to in a second. It has a problem that it's a lot of endogeneity between that index and a lot of other commodity market variables and inflation variables. So it's hard to know uh, what's really the, the global, global supply chain or is it demand and demand inside that indicator. Here we're getting a true uh, global supply chain index. And then policy recommendation, uh, which is really uh, useful for central banks. Uh, we heard uh, this morning with Isabel Schneier saying that we cannot look through uh, supply shocks. We can definitely not look through uh, the, the global supply chain shocks. So given that this is uh, a um, focus of policy, I wanted to say a few more comments on policy before I go to my comments on, on the paper. So uh, I think that uh, although the authors do a great job in doing the implication for monetary policy, there's a lot of other policy uh, implication from the paper, which they could have gone even further into. Uh, and I do, in fact, uh, do dwell on some of that, but maybe some are for future paper. But I think that clearly we're going to see going forward, it's not just the aggregate macro, which is going to be affected by global supply, global supply chain shocks, but different sectors. And they're going to be affected differently, depending on where uh, the pressure is going to be. And we see it with like uh, the car industry are lacking some uh, components which are being shipped by uh, cargo bears, other are lacking stuff due to production uh, issues. So there's going to be sectoral information which is going to be, be uh, affected, which policy needs to pay attention to. Uh, and I also think it's, um, th this study is really about the US. Uh, we are looking at different countries and we are going to see that there are quite similar responses across the countries, but there are also differences in particular with how uh, responsive uh, the macroeconomy is to policy. So to think about the global nature uh, and also coordination of policy might be much more important going forward. And I, um, as economists, we are always reactive. That means that uh, we are responding to the shocks. But this indicator allows you to be even more proactive in the sense of thinking long term ahead planning because you can observe these indicators uh, and this uh, congestion before it, it appears in your inflation data. So I think that's also a lot of the implication which we can take out from this. <clears throat> 
and for other governments, of course, it's uh, or for governments in general or, or policymaker outside monetary policy. Uh, we're going to see much more of these types of indicators b being constructed on different kind of issues based on high frequent data, data you observe by using machine learning techniques. Uh, and this to, to facilitate these kind of data will be really important for how we can monitor shocks in the market. Okay, so to the more of the paper, comments on the papers. Um, so I have three or four comments. So, but again, um, this is a quite dense paper because it relates both to the modeling of the index or constructing the index and the theory model and the empirical models. Uh, so some of, some of the assumptions they have to rely on is uh, the fact that the, fi the shipping routes and the speeds are fixed. And I think uh, overall, I think that's not a bad assumption, but is it always uh, plausible? Um, for instance, how might fluctuations in shipping logistic due to sanctions or political unrest affect the model output or just force majeure, uh, weather, etc.? These are the kind of thing which might, at least if, uh, if you think of climate change and more weather shocks, is going to disturb the market more frequently. And although I don't know a lot about the shipping market, I know a lot about the oil market and the tanking of the oil market. And I know there's a lot of delays uh, pushing uh, cargo uh, days back and forth due to weather. So controlling for this uh, will be important, in particular, if you're going to rely more on that index. So how important it will be to disturb the data, I don't know, but I think there is more of an issue than, 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 than they're assuming. So some sensitivity analysis would be useful here, uh, further. Uh, and then again, uh, because we're relying on this uh, satellite data, uh, how accurate is it? Uh, do it cover uh, all the ships? Uh, it doesn't cover all the ships, but do it cover all the ports equally? Uh, so how re reliable uh, can we be on the data? So that's going to be crucial for, for the conclusion. Uh, so that's one of the uh, also um, uh, information I think would be useful to know more about. And in particular, if um, it would be useful uh, going forward to compare systematically, maybe with some logs uh, of other ports to compare outcomes. Uh, the model uh, is applied to the US, uh, but there are country differences. Um, it's an easy thing to say, but I think it's an important thing uh, also to take into account that uh, Countries uh, depend on uh, depend differently on goods and commodities. Uh, obviously, we, re we rely on uh, on the shipment for the global goods, but some countries rely more on air and road transport, whereas others rely more on shipping. So that's also something which uh, would be uh, important to know going forward for for when you do the application, rather not for the construction. Um, and then there's, of course, a lot of other factors. So um, the world is more complicated than we can put into our models. So we all has to do, we have to do some assumptions. So what's the role of all the factors that are missing from here? Uh, so you mentioned geopolitical events, but also oil price uh, and uh, uh, other major policy changes could be important factor, which is not really related to supply chain disruption, but will be captured by the index because it's happening something at that time. And maybe it's okay to call it all supply chain disruptions if they have the same effect on the macroeconomy. But if they don't, then it, it's important to separate more factors. Uh, and uh, also the role about inflation expectation. I was missing, uh, or I was expecting maybe a bigger role of inflation expectation in the theory model and also the implication for data. And maybe I was looking even more for that because that's what, where we have been working the most. Uh, so supply chain disruptions are difficult to observe. So how, uh, how do households and firms observe them? Well, they do it through their, um, they, they will observe inflation picking up and then they will adjust their inflation expectations. So I think that's an important part of the picture. So I will say a few words more about oil and then inflation expectations. But the first, um, so here's a plot, to motivate that, here's a plot, um, taken from a paper we are currently working on, which builds on another paper we have just uh, published as well. 
uh, where we see that there's a lot of endogeneity between uh, the variables you are, uh, which uh, are relevant. So here on the top you have inflation and inflation expectation in the US, and on the bottom we have uh, we have the blue, the oil price, and the red is supply chain pressures, not your index, but the New York Fed index, because that's the one we used in our paper. So we would be very eager to use your index, but we are also having longer data set, so we couldn't see that. But there's a lot of endogeneity, and, and the idea would be how to find the underlying shocks for these variables. So for the oil price, you assume oil prices have minimal impact on shipping speeds due to the fixed shipping routes and, and, and con, uh, contractual obligation. Uh, but the idea, the idea is that fluctuation in oil prices cannot affect uh, operational costs and lead to adjustment in shipping behaviors. I think that is a, I think it's a strong assumption. I think that you can think of this in, in two different ways. So in normal times, it might well be so, but when there's high volatility in oil prices, I think that it might change, there might be a deviation from this. And I know, for instance, that uh, again, coming back to the oil market in Norway, that uh, when the ships are tanking uh, to, to fill up uh, oil in their um, shipment, they, ha they are playing around with, um, so they are playing around both with the weather, but also with regard to the tax system in Norway. So they can move shipment and cargoes around for days because the sea prices are trending in one direction or another, and that also is influencing the, tax, uh, the taxes, uh, how much they will be taxed. So there are uh, some uh, adjustment to, to the fluctuation in oil prices. Whether it will be important for, for your case, I don't know, but if, oil prices affect shipping behaviors. It will also affect the global supply chain uh, and inflation and other macro indicators in ways well, that is not accounted by your model. Uh, the inflation expectation, I already mentioned this, so I can be very brief, but uh, you, you, don't, you mentioned it, but you don't pay particular attention to it uh, because in your model, it will, uh, supply chains will affect production costs and capacity directly. But I think there are, and there's a big debate about the indirect effect of uh, inflation expectation. But, and that, but I think that in particular for oil supply, for supply chain disturbances, actual, uh, uh, actual inflation uh, is also affected by the expectations. So I think it comes, to, there's a direct effect, but I think in particular it's an indirect effect. Uh, and policymakers aim to anchor inflation expectations, so then understanding the dynamics uh, for inflation expectation in transmitting the global supply chain would be important to also know going forward. So, um, to, to the data uh, and, and to this, so, if, uh, so here on the left you, complain, you compare the global supply chain index uh, from the New York Fed, the dotted with your red, and here is the New York Fed for the longer period. This is the one we use in our paper. It's different from yours because we use uh, quarterly data and year and year. But we see that uh, we see that the trend you talked about is, is also here. But what's really striking, if you look at this in long-term perspective, is that the very flat pattern before the COVID. So it would be really nice if you could get, have your data prior to 2017, but I don't think you can have. Uh, Final comment, uh, I think, uh, you, and you mentioned, you used this graph and you mentioned the importance of demand earlier in the pandemic, and then the blue is, uh, sorry, the gray supply chain in picking up inflation. So in our paper, we are using again the global supply chain index, but we would love to have your index if it went further back. So that would be starting from this period here, 2017. We have more shocks because we also pay attention to oil supply shock, red, we had different economic shock, uh, but here is the global supply chain shock from, from the New York Fed, and we have some domestic shock. But, and we are making a proper identification to get away the effect of demand on global supply, like you pointed out. And when we do that, we do actually see that we get this demand in early in the 2020, as you get with your indicator. And then we get here is where we really want the global supply chain to matter, which you also find in your indicator. So we get related shock. But we also have the role of oil plus, the red one, in, in certain periods. Okay, so conclude, really nice paper, really liked it. Uh, uh, and it's important to understand the effect of the global supply chain disturbances, and I think it will go going forward as well for central banks. 
and I want more, meaning I want more data, more historical data if possible, and more analysis of this. There's huge policy implications, not just for monetary policy, but also for other policymakers. But the main challenge, I think, is it will be to understand the unabsorbable nature of this indicator, because you're constructing something we don't see. Uh, that's also the interesting part. Uh, but then continue to do research to make sure that other disturbances are not captured by this, and that it's robust to other shocks would be important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilde. Ilian, would you like to react? Yes. Um, so thank you so much Hilde, for all the excellent suggestions and questions. Um, so I wanted to start with the first, uh, not necessarily the first that you had, but uh, uh, the role of inflation expectations in our model. Uh, this, I recall that uh, we received a very interesting comment from a, um, from a comment from the other people on marginal resolution. Uh, which is basically saying that even though we didn't really see a word team transitory in the paper, but this paper that we have right now actually supports the idea that the inflation in the United States is transitory, was transitory. I guess um, this also you know, reflects what we have been discussing is what we have recovered, what we have found in this paper was that the global supply chain disruption, the shock itself will bring stagflationary risks to the United States, but we didn't really see how long this will be. So uh, in that sense, if we, you know, if we furnish our model with inflation expectations, this may lead to more pronounced and um, you know, even persistent effects on inflation. So I guess that's something that we could do with the model uh, for some future work. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. The other one is on, uh, I think, you know, you might be very interested in the data. Absolutely, yes. So um, uh, in terms of the fixed shipping routes and speeds, we have to say that uh, it is the feature of the industry we wanted to take advantage of. But uh, honestly, during this very high, uh, you know, very uncertain periods, for example, from, from the COVID to uh, to the uh, to the evasion of Russia to you know of Ukraine and also to the Red Sea crisis, a lot of the, you know a lot of things have happened and shipping companies might react endogenously to all of these events, but we wanted to emphasize that even though there could be some other changes to you know there could be some changes to these shipping routes and speeds, a lot of them will be transitory. Mm -hmm. So in that sense. Uh, you know, this nature, this rigidity of this very industry will still give us the advantage of identifying global supply chain disruptions uh, more clearly. Uh, and also another bit, it's on, uh, we were essentially saying there will be virtually no measurement errors using the satellite data. But yes, we do see some gaps in the satellite data. But in the other follow-up project, we are trying to, uh, you know, use these gaps as some information because if you think about this, um, you know, the frequency of the occurrence of such gaps and also, you know, where would these gaps, you know, uh, appear also carries some information about how the global supply chain disruption have been going on. So thank you so much for this. Um, and yes, and, uh, but one last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, if uh, in the end, because of, for example, the coverage, because we only have data from 2017 onwards, uh, if you, you wanted to use, for example, global supply chain pressure index from the New York Fed, or simply the shipping costs, which you have a longer sample, it's very easy to use that in our SVR framework. Because what we are trying to offer in this paper is not only this index itself, it's rather to think, uh, you know, what is the micro foundation of global supply chain disruptions. As long as you think maybe the global supply chain pressure index is better, it's very easy to integrate that into this AVR framework. And indeed, in the, in the paper, we show that you get very similar results in the end. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me open the floor for questions. Let me start here with Diego and then over there. Thanks, um, very nice paper. Um, I would like to push back against the notion that the ACR is not affected by demand. I mean, clearly, 
if uh, there is lots of demand for, for goods, for imports, you are going to put more containers in the ships mm -hmm. and it's going to take longer to unload those ships and the ships will have to wait until the, the berth is, is, is empty and, and the next one. So clearly that can affect it. How do you tell them the two apart, supply versus demand? Well, you look at quantities. What happened to containers shipped to the US? 2020, the number plummeted, okay? So that's consistent with your story. 2020, the increase in the, in the second part, the increase in 2020 in the second part of 2020 in the ACR is driven by supply. 2021, 2022, historical records. You have the number of containers going to the US, going to the roof. The ACR index is pushed by demand. And that's consistent with the notion that oil prices and you know, supply chain measures are moving so strongly because both of them are driven by demand. Okay, so you know, that seems like the, like the obvious omitted variable in that context. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Diego. This is a, uh, I guess you also mentioned this uh, in some of the previous conferences. Yes, so we have to say that, um, you know, we really cannot, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so this demand thing is something that we can really not get rid of because I would say that, you know, it of course is going to be affected by demand because you would imagine, for example, during the pandemic, there was a very large surge in, in demand for tradable goods in the States. Of course, shipping companies, they would deploy more capacity along these routes. But that's why essentially in the paper we were saying that, okay, it's not a perfect measure and we have taken all the things that we could do to try to make it as clean as possible. Uh, one thing that we have mentioned is that we're looking at a global, uh, you know, port congestion at a global scale. So in this sense, if you have some demand increases, uh, for example, in the States, that led to higher port congestion. In this sense, maybe some of the other places would see a decrease in port congestion. If you combine them together, you may not really see a very large uh, impact from demand. So, but we have tried to make it as clean as possible, but I agree with you, it's gonna be affected by this. Yeah, uh, may I ask, at one more point, sorry. Uh, I think also that leads to the beauty of using SVR because essentially, um, you know, the SVR framework would really gave you an edge not to uh, be so concerned about the endogeneity of a particular index uh, compared to, for example, uh, some other pseudo, uh, for example, um, I don't know, maybe natural experiments or event study. So I think in that sense, uh, maybe this framework could uh, still recover some of the uh, patterns of global supply chain disruptions, even though our index itself is subject to demand changes. Okay, I think we had two further questions over there. Hi, I'm Dimitri from Universita Pompeo Fabra. I was actually also going to ask about demand, um, but then my suggestion was um, to actually use this geographical heterogeneity and these things like the Panama Canal shock to isolate these supply pressures better, you know, because you might have some local supply shocks. And the second suggestion was to compute the waiting time, which I think you can do with your data to have a better measure of uh, congestion. Yeah, that's it. Yes, thank you so much. And I think we had another question over there. So Sajj Kozhan, researcher, Bank of Slovenia. Uh, I was just uh, curious uh, to ask uh, if you make a distinction between export-oriented and import-oriented ports that could maybe help with uh, like isolating the export and supply factors from demand factors. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there further questions, comments? I'm sure there's, okay, we have another one there. Uh, just very briefly, if you have considered exploiting the variation in different ports, so if I think about global supply chain disruptions, maybe there are some goods that are extremely hard to um, substitute, say a component in the car industry that you won't necessarily see in container data, but you might, it might have still a quite dramatic effect compared to some delayed container of, I don't know, kids' toys or something. Have you thought about these? May I respond? Yes, thank you so much for this. Um, yes, we, because what we have, you know, uh, for now in the 
in the in the analysis of this paper, we only use the weighted average ACR index for all the causal, you know, causality assessment. But I fully agree with you, no matter whether we could exploit the geographical differences or if we, for example, as uh, one of the, uh, you mentioned about the export-oriented, import-oriented ports, or even those components that may be only sourced from some particular locations, we could definitely do this. Um, but in the sense that uh, if we wanted to exploit these differences, uh, eventually, at least in this paper, we still have to use that in the uh, in the SVR framework. Maybe, I mean, uh, if we embed them, we could get a even sharper identification results uh, using this same stuff that we have. But we will try to have a look at them uh, because those actually, this, this aggregate data, uh, we have them available straight away. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to Il Young and, and Hilde and also for the other four speakers this morning. I think this was a great session and extremely insightful, and I invite you to continue discussions over lunch. We will have a lunch break now, and I think we reconvene at, at 2 p.m.